43. 43 days until the beginning of the World Cup in Russia. And today, to talk about England, of course, we have Dwayne Rollins on the line joining us live from England. Chris Hedich, uh, freelance reporter, soccer reporter. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. Uh, Kirsty, we, last week we had uh, one other uh, English uh, fellow on there, uh, expat, now James Sharman. Uh, and I started with the same question. I'm going to start with you. Every year, um, I, as someone with the English heritage, will convince myself the closer it gets to a World Cup that this one is the is the World Cup in which actually all those pieces are going to come together and England might actually contend to go deep. So tell me, why is that a crazy idea? Um. <laughs> I think it's potentially a crazy idea just because of how they finished the last European Championships. Um, the the problem with England is it doesn't seem as if they have a perfect opponent because they seem overawed by the prospect of the elite level teams and yet they seem petrified of stumbling against the minnows. So there's, there's no real uh, sweet spot for them in terms of opposition. Well, and fair enough. And, and you're looking at this group. There, there are some, some of both. Uh, you have your Belgiums in here. You have your Panamas in here. So, is it fair to say that maybe you're a little more uh, uh, concerned about how they'll perform against Panama than they might against the, uh, you know, the dark horse pick that a lot of people have in Belgium? Yeah, I think it's an interesting one in in, in that regard because for me, Belgium, they certainly have question marks over them, but none of them are about the players that will take to the field. It, it tends to center around Roberto Martinez, if I'm honest. I think. Tactically, there are a lot of accusations you can can throw at him. Um, his his predecessor, Mark Wilmots, I don't really think had a game plan. It was very much just go out on the field and and, and do what you want to do. Whereas Martinez, to be fair to him, definitely has a plan. He has an idea of, of what he wants to do. But I, I saw Kevin De Bruyne criticize the tactics after a friendly against Mexico, and and I think for me it's things like that where. I just have concerns kind of about how they'll defend, partly because of his time at Everton and Wigan where he could organize a nice attack or a good possession system, but but not much of a defense. And and then just in general, how the team will, will flow with each other. One of the important part of the next few weeks is seeing who's going to be in form coming June. And there's been a lot of rumors over the last few days that Harry Kane will not be 100%. And how important is Kane to England's chances? And is it too close the time remaining until the World Cup to find another option if Kane is, in fact, injured? Um, I think... Yes, Harry Kane is, is important because he's that focal point in, in attack. He's someone that, that not only um, offers you goals, but I think offers you a bit of creativity as well, which is not something you can always say about a, a leading forward. Um, and I think for, for that reason, yeah, he's, he's got enough time to, to get back into form and where, where he wants to be. I think you see now he's scoring goals still. I mean, he picked up one there against Watford. Um, on Monday, and he's got you know three games left of the the Premier League season um, to to try and and get back on track and build more momentum. In terms of whether they have a, a plan B, it's it's probably Jamie Vardy. Um, I think that the difficulty Vardy has is that if you're going to play against these sides like Panama, that will will sit a bit deeper. Whether he has that space to run into that he thrives on, I think saying that the the, the pace that he offers. Um, the intelligent running, the industry, those are all qualities that I think will mesh well with what Gareth Southgate is trying to build and, and what they have really elsewhere on the pitch with this uh, potential 3-5-2 or 5-3-2, depending on how you look at it, formation. You mentioned Gareth Southgate, and I think it hasn't been analyzed enough on, on our side, at least. Gareth Southgate was never meant to be the man behind England, never meant to be the selector and the manager. Unfortunately, Sam Allardyce and his uh, lack of ethics <laughs> in his first few days as a manager cost him his job, and Gareth Southgate was the interim and eventually had the interim tag taken away. Does he have the chops to, to manage at a World Cup? I know it's a might be an unfair question, but we're looking at managers uh the world of, of football international football at the highest possible stage venues can gareth southgate really 
lead England tactically and maybe even in the choice of form, choice of players and any given day. It starts soon, June 18th, first game against Tunisia, and then the 24th of June, their second game. Can Gareth Southgate get the best out of his players? I think so. I think it, it's the thing with, with Southgate to me he has quite a, a polarizing um, perception because he did do a lot of good work with with England's under twenty ones. He um, he built a good side. He filled it with confidence, and then they got to a tournament having beaten Croatia. I think it was in in a playoff, and then they just kind of tanked, which is which is obviously a concern um, because I think you're always going to try and extrapolate something from that past. Experience experience into to here I, I think again he's got the confidence of the players um, I think he's got a very clear and, and defined ideology um, tactically which I don't think you could always have said with with England tournaments recently but I think ultimately he knows that that it, this is his chance I, I think if he if he performs poorly here and by poorly I mean doesn't get out of the group I think he knows he's finished at that point um, and I think there's just been a little bit, bit more of a a sort of self-confidence um, about him, a little bit more of a uh, a gravitas, if you will, about the way that he carries himself. I noticed that when when he spoke about um, the foreign secretary complaining about Russia and and talking about that the whole situation and how it impacted football, I just thought he handled it with a real class and dignity that that spoke of a leader, let alone just someone representing the football association. Uh, Christian, I am just old enough to remember Gary Lineker at the end of his career. Obviously, Alan Shearer, Wayne Rooney are the two England focal point strikers that I most remember. And both of those players uh, had some flaws in their game. You go back to Harry Kane now, and I wonder when you look at him and look at him as the as your focal point, as your, your person you're going to most rely on to, to put those offense, whether it's fair to say that this is maybe a generational player when it comes to English players, that this is the best um, sort of lead offensive player that, that England has had in, in you know, probably an entire generation, if, if not a couple. Yeah, I w- <clears throat> I'd be willing to go along with that. I think um, I think the level he's at, the, the goals he's scoring, um, the way that he plays in general, I think his, his, uh, his variety in play in terms of what he can do, creating goals, scoring them, being that link-up player, it, it's a lot harder to play as a lone front man than I think a lot of people realise. Um, and he does it with, I would say, such uh, brilliance as, as as well as harmony with the rest of his team that, yeah, I, w- I would certainly agree. So he's a once-in-a-generation player, I think, from an English perspective. Chris, when we're looking at the other teams in the group, of course, we have Belgium, Panama, and Tunisia. Tunisia, the first adversary of... England in this tournament on June 18th in Volgograd, which is the weird stadium with half the standings like outside of the stadium that you can't actually see the pitch. Well, that's something else. Uh, it's going to make for, for nice pictures. But how important is that first game against a beatable opponent? Yes, you can handicap this group by looking at Panama and maybe Tunisia, the two bottom team of this group but you kind of have to win the games to make sure this is going to be the case so the game on june 18th against tunisia how important is it i think it's important to to um set up a a foundation really for the tournament i think they've they've obviously got panama second and then finished with with belgium as you alluded to there and and in theory, you can be pretty much qualified by the time that you meet Belgium in that third game. And and if they do their thing, then in theory, you're, you're both helping each other through into that last game, maybe with a, with a draw. So it's, I think for, for me, it's important to set that standard early on. It's it's nice in terms of building momentum as well. I think if you had Belgium first and you know you suffer a defeat, then instantly there's more pressure on, on Tunisia. Whereas realistically, with that first game, if it goes terribly... You do kind of know at the same time you've got um, two opportunities to, to fix it and turn things around. Uh, Christian, if I were to go E-A-S-Y, I think most England fans would know what I'm referring to in terms of the famous headline which proclaimed England's group as, as being easy uh, for them and then it turned out to, to not quite be quite that way. This, again, looks like a, a group that is advanceable from uh, with, with some ease. What has the reaction to the draw been, been in England and how confident 
is the English press, the English people in England's ability to get out of this group? Um, I think when it comes to, to expectation, th that to me has been a little bit ambiguous at the minute. I think there are certainly people that are expecting um, victories against Tunisia and, and Panama because of their standing in in world football. Um, but I think in, in general, the actual tournament, it, it does kind of fluctuate. It's it's very polarizing in, in so much as there are certainly pessimists who believe there's little chance they get out of the group. There are those who think they get out of the group and are then shot down by the first knockout opponent that they meet. There are some that think, you know what, this this, this team, it's young, it's vibrant, it's exciting. Um, it's it's performed well in qualifying, which is a staple of, of English football. They perform well in qualifying, if nothing else. Um, and, and that they could finally sort of make that run and get to a, a quarter, maybe even a, a semi-final. So it's, I think it's very wide-ranging. Wide I think that's why the, the first game or the first even two games, those are the ones where really you start to to refine your expectations and, and, and whittle them down. One team we haven't talked about in this group is Panama. And I know you have a lot of information with CONCACAF. You've been following what's going on over here for, for a long time now, Chris. Panama. Usually, CONCACAF teams in recent history has performed well in the World Cup. If we're looking at Costa Rica in 2014 and Mexico, obviously. How dangerous can Panama be? And can they be the monkey in the wrench in that group and maybe cause a surprise and finish second? It's it's an interesting theory. I think the thing with Costa Rica is, um, I mean, Mexico for me are, are a lot more established. They have players that have been playing in the, the top leagues in Europe and, and all this kind of stuff. Whereas I think with Costa Rica, it was more of a surprise. But what I think made them so um, difficult to beat was, was actually how well built their style was. Um, they clearly had strength in the, the wing back position with the likes of Gamboa, I think Junior Diaz was there as well. And and they used that. They used the fact that they had speed in transition, that they had a little bit of quality with Ruiz and with Joel Campbell. And I think it was actually a really well-constructed side. From what I've seen of Panama personally, I don't see that same meticulous approach. I don't see that same attention to detail. Um, I think, yeah, a player like Gabby Torres is, is someone that has a bit of quality, obviously has, has played in MLS, so has been... A little bit more conscious than than others, but uh, I personally think well, they're more likely to mirror Honduras than than, than Costa Rica or Mexico, um, just because I, I think that, that there's no polite way to say it. They lack quality across the field, and and yes, they might be defensive, they might grind out a nil nil um, or even a one nil, but I, I think to actually take it to teams like that, it's it's not something that will suit them at all. Um, turns out Costa Rica had a pretty good keeper too, uh, if you look back on that, but. Uh... Christian, I want to turn attention a little bit away from, from the tournament itself and, and look at what's going to happen immediately before. Uh, obviously, the bid for 2026 uh, has a lot of interest in, in the part of the world that Kevin and I are in with the United bid uh, being a part of that. The more that we track this, the more that we look at this, the more it looks like Monaco is gaining, Morocco, pardon me, is gaining traction and, and may now be the favorite to win this. How are you seeing the 26 bidding process from, from where you sit? Um... It feels more political than I think I can remember in, in recent years. Um, the the inclusion of uh, America's <clears throat> dear leader in, in proceedings, trying to, to sway things to encourage um, more votes for the US. I, I do sense that, that Morocco has that um, that strength because the thing is, if, if infrastructure is not there, I, I don't think that really concerns FIFA because I think if you look at a number of the, the recent World Cups, they've all needed significant infrastructure upgrades and I think if anything they kind of like that because it almost shows that they're doing something positive by their encouraging building and, and improvement in the country's facilities etc um, and it doesn't really impact their ability to then come in and, and make a, a boatload of cash for want of a better term um, I think the US would be lovely um, the, the last US World Cup was just before my time in terms of consciousness but I, I think um, for me, it's probably going to end up being Morocco um, as, as appealing as a, as a joint bid for the U.S. might be. Is there a danger if Morocco wins that bid of maybe our feet not following our lips? There's been a lot of lip service over the last few years talking about the 
sustainability of World Cup bids in time, the sustainability financially, and the wasting of resources to build white elephant stadiums. Is there a danger if the Morocco bid wins of really showing the world that uh, this was just pure talk? Um, to, to a certain degree, I think look, the, the, the problem is, is that <clears throat> the, the two upcoming World Cups, the one next month and, and 2022, have been uh, somewhat controversial, I would say. Um, controversial for, for different reasons, obviously. I, I think it's less been about the, the, the white elephant stadiums that you talk about and more about political issues surrounding it. Um, I, I'm not sure if it'll go quite the same way um, in that sense, I think I think that you're always going to struggle to to really harness and and make use of that much development because it is often huge. Um, and I think that if if some positive comes out of it, then that's really all we can hope for. We we of course focused most of this interview on England and its group, but but to end it, uh, Christian, we'll we'll go with with an overarching question for the World Cup. Uh, most people understand who the favorites are, but but let's hear it from you. Who do you see going deep in this tournament and ultimately standing in the confetti at the end of it? Ah, uh, wow! I think Brazil and Spain are two teams that I expect to go far in in this one. Um, although those are at least the the two that um, I think have the potential to to stand in in that confetti, as you said. Yeah, as, as they say there. All right, well, there, there you go. It's the, the same ones come back and forth. I'll, I'll ask one more quick one. Um, the Dark Horse. If, if there's a team that's never won before, a country that's never won before, who, who could you see it being? Oh, wow. Um, a, a team that's never won. The team that keeps sticking out to me when I hear about Dark Horse is is Serbia. Um, whether they can go all the way is, is a big shout, a very big shout indeed. Um uh, but I could see them at least causing an upset. I could see them being the the, the chili of, of 2018, if you will. All right. Anything you want to promote before we say goodbye? I'm, I'm good at the minute. Not not doing anything that needs pushing, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. And we'll uh, we'll talk soon, perhaps. Uh, uh, maybe we'll get you a little later on and talk some, talk some club football, as we always like to do. All right, Christian. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. You can follow Christian Ennage on social media at K Ennage. We'll be right back on the World Cup today. Patreon.com is where you can support us. You like the daily format during the World Cup? We'll need your help to make sure we have enough coffee to stay awake during a month. Patreon.com slash sports podcast network. Dwayne, I have no clue what the guy's saying right now. Like, maybe we should sort of learn Russian before, like, before now, but it's not easy to learn. No, well, they got the different characters. That, that always makes things complicated. Uh, Russia is one of the most terrifying languages on Earth. Uh, you, <laughs> you could be saying, like, you know... You are a cuddly teddy bear, and it would sound ominous in Russian. Uh, no offense to any Russian listeners out there, but it, it truly would. Uh, uh, what a beautiful cuddly teddy bear sounds like. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get murdered in my sleep. <laughs> an upside down letter? Yeah, no. How do I pronounce that N? Is it an N? It's upside down. I don't know. I'm confused. Let's talk about English. There you, there you go. Um, yeah. Uh, where do you go with Christian's uh, interview there? I mean, I, England's always a big question, Kevin, and I don't know what to think about it. And I think that he sort of nailed it, that reading the English press, and it's obviously the one that we kind of follow. Well, not, I shouldn't speak for you, but in English Canada, certainly they, well, look the foreign at what countries I'm that we follow closely. Like, I'm wearing an England jersey, three lions on my heart right now. Not saying it's the only one I have. I have about 10 different national team shirts, but... Uh, England is part of my heritage. There's France, England, and obviously if Canada was in the World Cup, it would be the heritage, but alas. Exactly. So, but, but there is, I think, this this like reluctance that I'm sensing in England this time to truly embrace hope. 
Um, because in my lifetime, that's always been the thing that you always see. And I joke about that with the first question with these guys. It's like, oh, why, why are we going to get killed this time? Is because there has been like people get their their hopes up, and they always point to something. And this time it might be Harry Kane's form. It might be even some people, as I've said, might point to the success they've had at Youth World Cups and say, well, this is a an indicator that things are going to get better soon. And 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 maybe you say Liverpool making a Champions League final, although being you know d- no, their England. best players. Hey, James Milner scored yesterday. Granted, it was with his face against his own net, but still, he scored. Yeah, I don't know if Henderson and Milner are necessarily the, the players that are uh, pacing Liverpool right now, but but nonetheless, it's it's you know there's lots of reasons you can point to hope, but but I don't know, and I honestly don't know what to think about. They should get out of the group. We don't know much about Tunisia, honestly. Uh, those Northern African teams generally are competitive, though. Uh, you look at Algeria over the years. You look at Morocco over the years. They they tend to be good teams, not necessarily great teams in a World Cup. That can be tricky to get by, but but England should be able to get past them. Um, Christian did mention Panama, and, and I do think they probably are a step below uh, what you would see uh, Costa Rica being out there or, or the United States even if they qual- had they qualified. But uh, uh, you know, then again, England. You go back in their history, and they drew Trinidad and Tobago in, in their one and only World Cup. So it's it's complicated for them. And, and the other part of it is, too, if you want to go deep into a tournament, you really need to win your group. And whether England can be good enough to beat Belgium, I don't know. Yeah. Belgium remains to me. They're, they're in, I mean, maybe it's because they're a French country, too. It's the French countries always throw you for a loop. You don't quite know what to make of them. Uh, they always have drama going on behind the scenes, it seems like. And uh, Well, <laughs> with Belgium, my feeling is, is the talent is there. It's going to be about Roberto Martinez. And is Roberto Martinez the type of manager, I don't want to say qualified enough, because the guy's qualified, nothing to do with that. But it's experience at the international level. Being able to influence the result of a team, of a game, with the short, the smallest amount of actual substitution or words or, or directions you give your team is to be able to think of the future to be able to imagine three games in a week and a half and trying to find ways to have an output of performance that's consistent in those three resting a few players especially the way this calendar for England is is made it's kind of an easy one for England and Belgium in a way because uh, if you're England you start with Tunisia on June 18th your second game is June 24th on Saint Jean Baptiste maybe I'll have a nice little present for me with the win against Panama and then the week after is versus Belgium, the, fin- the, the final game in Group T. So it's an easy setup to come into maybe the third group game with already two wins behind you and a favorable differential, which you can rest players against Belgium. And you never know if you're going to face them again in the tournament. It is possible in that stage if both teams make it out. So you do want to maybe not show all your cards in the last game of the group stage if you got the two wins already and a favorable differential. Yeah, and by that time, you're going to know what the other groups, how they're shaking out in terms of what your your round of 16 matchup will be, right? And there are occasions in a World Cup where it's advantageous for you to be on the, the number two spot of the draw, so you, you don't necessarily know how you approach that game. Um, I look at this group the more I look at it, and again, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be a Tunisian football expert here. It, it's not... Uh, a team that I have a great deal of knowledge of, and and maybe ne- maybe next cycle if you hit us on the Patreons, I'll really start to fo- focus on Northern African football. That that might be a, a goal there if you can you know get me up to about a thousand a month or so. Um, so you know get get donating, folks. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I look at this group and I have to think England should get out of this, and England does usually get out of groups. They they usually get out of the round of 16. They generally trip up in the quarterfinals. That's England's pattern, and that's England's position really in the world. And if you you know, look at this objectively, like um, you know, uh, Soccernomics did a few years ago. It, it, it shouldn't be a surprise that a country of England's size and stature falls out around that level because that's about their level. But, but I, I don't quite know what to make of this one. But as I said, you know, Belgium is the more interesting team in so many ways for me because if they get rolling, uh, they have the talent to me to be the answer to that question I asked Christian, who is the team that wins a World Cup and has never won it before for their country. And, uh, you know, Belgium would be one of the smaller, well, I think it might even be the smallest country to, to have wanted if they were to do so. Um, the infighting is the main reason no one's talking about them right now. So this is going to be an interesting World Cup for them and uh, to see what they can do. I'm excited by it. I do think, Kevin, yeah. that when you look at the international game, 
Um, it is becoming closer and closer in my mind until we have a true upset winner of the World Cup. I think tactics are yeah. are becoming more universal so that you could have a Greece, you could have a you know Greece 2004, you could have a Portugal uh, 2016 happen at a World Cup uh, that, a, that a country gets rolling and, and is able to completely shock the world with a win that that to me could happen whether it happens here i don't know but i think it could and and the you know you go back even 12 years ago it wasn't really possible that more than five or six teams could have won but now i think it's likely that those same five and six teams are going to win but there is just that slim chance that you might get a true stunner out there now i think well especially if germany and spain don't perform the way we expect them to be one of those two big favorites and you'd like our top four favorites, probably Spain, Brazil, Germany, and France. Those would be maybe the top four. If a few of those teams don't make it out of the group or get booted out early on in the knockout stage, then it could be very open. If Spain and Germany gets booted out, well, guess what? It's an open tournament. But for me, if I'm looking at Group G and I'm thinking how it's going to end that group, my prediction for this group, is Belgium winning on differential only? Equal points for England in second, Panama third, Tunisia fourth. Tunisia, no points. I think Tunisia's gonna lose all their games. I just hope they score a goal, which we haven't <laughs> there you been go. able to. Because uh, um. when I look at Tunisia, I'm like, yeah, it's like us. It's like if we would qualify, that's what we would look like at the World Cup. Saying we, I mean Canada right now. Well, precisely, yeah. All right. Well, next week, our, our our at least our plan right now is to focus probably on France and and the French teams. Uh, so we'll we'll look to get the a French speaking journalist on here that follows French football closely. Uh, we're working on that one, and and maybe we'll have a little more to say about a country like Tunisia at that point. But but nonetheless, um, getting excited a little bit for this now. The more I think about it, and part of it's because to me, there's only really one game left in the European football season right now. Uh, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But uh, you mean the championship playoffs, right? That's what you're talking about. That's what that's what well, you're excited for. Well, that'll be fun. But yes, yeah, gotta no, see whether poor Cardiff can get back up again or something. No, yeah, we would. Uh, exciting show tomorrow on Soccer Today. We're working on a few things, uh, interesting topics to talk about, and maybe going out of the famous box as well tomorrow and talk about real real issues in the world of football with a soccer perspective as always you like the show world cup today we will be going daily during the world cup at 10 a.m or so depending on the day and our schedule but live every day on our youtube page youtube.com slash sports podcasting network patreon.com is where you can support us financially patreon.com slash sports podcasting network two dollars a month will give you access to the two solitude soccer podcast for patrons only an exclusive show where we talk about canadian soccer and the canadian premier league brand new episode coming later today and as always you can follow Dwayne on twitter at 24th minute myself at kev laramie and we'll be back with soccer today tomorrow